We all think we know the story of Galileo Galilei. It's painted as the ultimate story of progress versus tradition, science versus dogma. You have this lone hero of science with his newfangled telescope who proves the Earth orbits the Sun. And in the other corner, you have the big, bad church, so terrified of the truth that it forces him to renounce his work and buries his discovery. It's a clean, simple story. But the thing is, it's almost completely wrong. What if this legendary showdown wasn't about science versus faith at all? What if the real story was way more complicated and, honestly, way more explosive? A story packed with fragile politics, massive egos, and a personal betrayal that threatened to shatter the very foundations of 17th century Europe. The real reason the church went after Galileo is a story they tried to bury for centuries. It reveals how one of history's greatest minds was silenced, not for what he saw in the sky, but for the enemies he made right here on Earth. So, to get to the real story, we have to start by tearing down the biggest myth that the Catholic Church was just anti-science. Back in the early 1600s, that just wasn't true. Actually, the Church was one of the main funders of science, especially astronomy. Some of the best astronomers on the continent were Jesuit priests who were working in incredible church-funded observatories. And the idea that the Earth moves around the Sun, heliocentrism, wasn't some shocking new heresy. A Catholic cleric named Nicolaus Copernicus had published his Sun-centered model almost a hundred years earlier, back in 1543. He even dedicated his book detailing his theories to the Pope. For decades, the Church mostly saw it as a curious mathematical model, a useful way to predict where planets would be, but not a description of how things actually were. The scientific and religious consensus was still that the Earth stood still. And this wasn't just blind faith. There were real scientific arguments against a moving Earth at the time, like the fact that no one could observe the expected shift in the stars, known as stellar parallax. For a long time, the Church was perfectly fine letting astronomers kick the theory around. The science itself wasn't the issue. The problem was Galileo. Or, more to the point, it was Galileo's absolute certainty, his abrasive personality and the dangerously unstable world he was living in. Galileo Galilei was a genius, no doubt. He was also passionate and, by most accounts, unbelievably arrogant. He was a master of self-promotion with a real knack for making powerful enemies. In 1609, he got his hands on a powerful new telescope and pointed it at the sky, and what he saw changed everything. He saw mountains on the moon, proving it wasn't some perfect heavenly sphere. He found four moons circling Jupiter, which showed that not everything in the universe orbited the Earth. And crucially, he saw that Venus went through phases, just like our moon, which pretty much confirmed it had to be orbiting the Sun. Now, these discoveries didn't give 100% definitive proof of heliocentrism, but they completely wrecked the old Earth-centered model. And Galileo didn't want to just talk about it as a possibility. He wanted to shout it from the rooftops as fact. He started arguing, very publicly, that the Church had to reinterpret the Bible to make room for his science. This was a huge deal. Here was a layman, a scientist, telling the entire Church hierarchy how to read their own sacred text. The first official slap on the wrist came in 1616. The powerful Cardinal Robert Bellarmine, speaking for the Inquisition, told Galileo that heliocentrism was now considered false and contrary to Holy Scripture. Galileo was officially forbidden from holding or defending the idea as a physical reality. He could still talk about it, but only as a hypothesis. For a little while, Galileo played along, but staying quiet just wasn't in his DNA. So why the ferocious reaction? To get that, you have to look away from the stars and down at the chaos tearing Europe apart. 
This was the peak of the Counter-Reformation. The Catholic Church was locked in a desperate struggle for survival against the rise of Protestantism. And the entire Protestant Reformation had been ignited by people challenging the Church's authority, specifically its exclusive right to interpret the Bible. So when Galileo came along, demanding that the Church change its reading of Scripture because of his telescope, he sounded dangerously familiar. Politically, the Church felt it couldn't afford to look weak. It had to project an image of absolute unwavering authority. Letting some layman publicly force its hand on Scripture was a non-starter. Theologians would point to verses like in the book of Joshua, where God makes the sun stand still as literal proof that the earth was the center of everything. They argued that until there was ironclad 100% proof, which Galileo didn't have, there was no reason to abandon the clear word of the Bible. In fact, Galileo's favorite argument that the Earth's motion caused the ocean tides was completely wrong and didn't convince anyone. But the final nail in the coffin was personal. In 1623, a man named Maffeo Barberini, a longtime friend and huge admirer of Galileo, became Pope Urban VIII. Galileo thought he had it made. The Pope gave him permission to write a book comparing the two systems, geocentrism and heliocentrism, but with one critical rule. He had to treat both sides impartially and conclude that, ultimately, no one could know for sure because God's power is infinite. Galileo agreed. In 1632, he published his masterpiece, Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems. It was brilliant, but it was anything but impartial. The character arguing for the church's earth-centered view was named Simplicio, which basically means simpleton, and he came across as a bumbling, dogmatic idiot. And the ultimate insult? Galileo put the Pope's own arguments, the very ones he had shared with Galileo in private, right into Simplicio's mouth. Urban VIII, already walking a political tightrope and being called weak by his enemies, felt personally betrayed and publicly humiliated. His old friend had just made him look like a fool on the world stage. He was furious, and Galileo was about to feel the full wrath of the Inquisition. With the Pope's friendship now turned to rage, Galileo was hauled to Rome in 1633 to face the Inquisition. The main charge wasn't just his belief in a sun-centered system. The legal case was built on the idea that he had deliberately defied the 1616 order that forbade him from defending the theory. His own book was Exhibit A. Faced with the terrifying threat of formal torture, the nearly 70-year-old Galileo was broken. He was found vehemently suspect of heresy. On his knees before the cardinals, he was forced to abjure, curse, and detest his own life's work. He was sentenced to live under house arrest for the rest of his days. But this is how the church truly tried to hide the truth. It wasn't just about silencing one man. Galileo's dialogue, Copernicus's original book, and any other work that argued for heliocentrism as a fact were all placed on the index of forbidden books. This was the church's official blacklist. For generations, this severely hampered mainstream astronomical debate in the Catholic world. It didn't stop the spread of ideas completely, especially in Protestant countries, but it sent a chilling message. This conversation is over. The church won the battle against Galileo, but it was already losing the war for knowledge. While Galileo lived out his last years under guard, dying in 1642, the scientific revolution he helped start was unstoppable. In Protestant Northern Europe, far from the Inquisition's grasp, thinkers like Johannes Kepler and, later, Isaac Newton built on his foundations, cementing heliocentrism as undeniable fact. Slowly and very reluctantly, the church started to backpedal. In 1758, 
it quietly lifted the general prohibition on books that taught a sun-centered model. But it took until 1835 for Galileo's own dialogue to finally be dropped from the banned list. It took nearly 360 years for the church to formally admit it was wrong. In 92, Pope John Paul II gave a speech admitting that the church's theologians had made a tragic mistake. He famously called the whole ordeal a tragic mutual incomprehension and acknowledged the immense suffering inflicted on Galileo. It was a stunning, centuries-late admission that the truth, no matter how hard you try to hide it, eventually finds its way to the light. The Galileo affair is such a powerful reminder that history is almost never the simple story we learn in school. If you enjoyed this look at the history they didn't want you to know, do us a favor and hit that subscribe button and ring the bell so you don't miss our next investigation. And drop a comment below. What other historical myths should we tackle next? So, why did the church hide the truth about Galileo? It wasn't a simple fear of science. It was a fear of things falling apart. It was the perfect storm. A brilliant but reckless scientist, a proud and insulted pope, and a powerful institution terrified of losing its authority in an age of religious and political chaos. The church silenced Galileo not because he was looking at the stars, but because his unapologetic certainty was a direct threat to its power on earth. The whole affair became a cautionary tale, not of science versus faith, but of what happens when new knowledge crashes into old power. And it shows that the biggest obstacle to finding the truth is often not ignorance, but the fear of what that truth will change. Do you have a friend who can benefit from the truth? Share this with them and let them know that, with so many fears in today's world, the truth should not be one of them.